Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. All right, thanks for coming. Hopefully, I was, I was a little unsure about this book for a new book of yours. I was thinking, do people still read Pauline Cowell or do they want to hear about her? But it looks like a nice little turnout. And Lenny is the director of the Manans Public Library. If any of you know him, he's an amazing film expert. In fact, I brought him the book down and I said, Lenny, I was thinking of you for this book. And he said, I go, you know a lot about movies. And he said, that's the only thing I know anything about. So, <laughs> <laughs> But if you've been down to the Manans Library, they have film series all the time. Um, I think they just finished with an Elizabeth Taylor series. So check out their website, and I, they show movies. They show more movies there in a week than we show in a year here. So now Lenny's, um, we don't show any here. The kids' room, oh, okay. the kids room shows them. Okay. But anyway, Lenny has an MFA in film studies from Columbia University, and he, this little thing he sent me, he studied under Andrew Saras. He wrote in the Village Voice at the same time that she was. Pauline Cal was in The New Yorker, and I guess they were, as Lenny says, they were intellectual foes. So here's Lenny Zapala to give us a review of the new book. I, it's called from her, 13 of her books, um, The Age of Movies by Pauline Cal. Lenny? And edited by Mr. Sanford Schwartz. We might as well oh, okay. make sure we, we get his name on the record. Oh, that's right, okay. Yeah, Sanford Schwartz. Uh, actually, it's interesting because Almost at the same time, there was a biography. Miss Kale came out called Pauline Kale. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. At, at this time, there was also a um, biography of Miss Kale was published almost the same day. It's called Pauline Kale and Life in the Dark by Brian Kello. Now, do, just out of curiosity, since Miss Kale died in uh, 2001, does anybody remember reading her, or who lived, anybody lived in New York City at the time? No. No, but you're familiar with what she wrote, because she used to write these very, very long, involved pieces, especially in the New Yorker magazine. She tended to write very long, and she used this sort of like uh, very powerful and flowery, well, I couldn't say a flower, but very powerful language. Um, very reminiscent of a, another film critic named uh, Manny Farber, who used to uh, write in the, in the 50s up into the 60s. I think he even might be still alive, but he used to, he was one of these guys who was a tough knuckle guy, and he always had an editor because he, he would like invent words, like it, which, like the word like swoosh and, and sweeze and stuff like that. But anyways, he was a very um, passionate guy, and it, it was part of her passion was, of course, was the motion pictures. Now, I just have a little question. Why do we need critics? Anybody have a guess? I mean, why would, because in, when I was living in New York in the, uh, in the 70s, I mean, this was serious stuff. What, what Pauline Kael would say about such and such a movie, uh, notoriously for Last Tango in Paris, when it first came out, she thought it was like a, one of the great revelations of the history of art. Uh, that led to an entire, in Time Magazine, the entire thing of Last Tango in Paris. Um, and it was part of her passion and her whatever, as opposed to the other people. Now, Miss Kale thought of herself. She was asked, you know, <laughs> one of her famous quotes here, as to why do we need uh, art critics. It says, in the arts, the critic is the only independent source of information. The rest is advertising. So this is essentially how he, she saw herself. But I think it would also help, especially later when she was in conflict with other critics of uh, contemporaries of hers, was um, her basically her background. And to a certain extent, her last lack of formal education. She was born in 1919 in Pentaluma, California. She lived on a chicken farm. She was the oldest of five children. Uh, she apparently was a, uh, a brilliant high school student, uh, had a debating club, uh, 
um, you, know, fight, you know, whatever the highest national honor society, whatever they had back in the 20s. And so she was going to go to the University of Berkeley to become a philosophy major and to be a writer. Well, school bordered to tears. Had a lot to do with the ordered structure, had a lot to do with the fact that being a woman, this is in the early, this is in the mid 1930s, sit down and shut up was probably, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, only the men can have ideas. And she tended to gravitate towards um, bisexual poets at that time. So, <laughs> pardon? Oh, she had a child, but we'll get into that. That's, that's later. But anyways, so she became a friend of the poet Robert Horan. And she decided in, in the middle of World War II, this is 1943, that they were going to go and live in New York City. So while she was living in New York City, she actually lived in Grand Central Station for a while, doing panhandling and things like that. And when she, and when there is this unfortunate story from her point of view is that the gentleman she went with, Mr. Horn, one day he was out begging for whatever, place to live, place to sleep, and he ran into the composer Samuel Barber and his lover, the, the uh, sculptor Gian, uh, Gino uh, Mechanet. And they, and they, and well, they said, you want to come home with us? And they said, yeah. So there was poor Pauline. She was all stuck by herself. <laughs> so she did also a uh, job. One of the things she was also was, was a potentially a gifted violin player. If she chose to be, she could have been a concert level viol violinist. So she hung around New York City for a few years, tried to get things published, did all sorts of odd jobs, you know, the usual things, waiting tables, this, that, teaching violin, tutoring, oh, all sorts of stuff. But finally, by 1948, it was clear this was going nowhere fast, and she moved back to the San Francisco area. In 1948, she also had a child by the poet James Broughton, B-R-O-U-G-H-T-O-N, who was also bisexual. And the child was named Gina. And in the early 50s, she was running a laundry, basically for her, for her daily bread. But all this time, she's hanging around the coffee you know, the coffee uh, scene, the coffee club scenes, the, uh, the clubs and whatnot that were in the 50s early 50s, uh, with Beat Jenner, the beats were starting to arrive, especially, it seemed the beats seemed to be centered two places, New York City and San Francisco seemed to be the places that they were centered. So she was in the right place at one time. So in 1952, she's hanging around in this coffee house, and she's having this animated argument with someone uh, about a movie. And there's this guy named Peter D. Martin, who happens to be sitting a few th tables away. And he's about to uh, publish a, a magazine about movies. He's going to call City Lights. And he would like her if she wouldn't mind reviewing a movie. So she did. And at age 33, she finally finds herself. She finally finds all these years of basically stumbling around, single mother, doing all sorts of stuff. All of a sudden, she finds her gifts, her talents, are finally centered in, into writing a movie review. And right from the very beginning, her first review is of Limelight, which is a very, one of the, Charlie Chaplin's last movies. Many people think his, his last good movie. And being typical, Pauline Kael, she hated it. <laughs> she thought it was awful. She thought it was, and this, would, this is this type of thinking that would put her in conflict with a group of people that were called the auteurists. But that's, that's not for another 10 years. Because people who are Charlie Chaplin, people who see Charlie Chaplin's career as this flowing river and going off into the sunset uh, would say, well, this is you know, a meaningful end of his career and he's just summing up his life as a performer, et cetera. While well, she just saw it as a maudlin piece of self-indulgence. I mean, who, who else can actually create their own death scene and, you know, and have it as some spectacular death scene where you just sort of lay there? So now that she's become this rather, uh, becomes established, she begins to then also do radio stuff, especially this is all in the West Coast. And she eventually uh, draws a, a fairly large following. It's taking a fairly long time for her to get this following about. 
and to the point where she's, she actually is one of the first people to actually publish a book of her collections of her writings. Now, she's written somewhere in the neighborhood of, um, some people think maybe 10,000 10, plus movie reviews, statements about this, that, and the other thing. And the first thing she, she uh, published, first group someone collected her works was called, I Lost It at the Movies. They tend to have this in her collections, tend to have interesting titles. I Lost It at the Movies, Kiss, Kiss, Bang, Bang, Going Steady, Deeper into Movies, Reeling, When the Light Goes Down, uh, Taking It All In, Hooked. These are, these are the same, you sort of sense there's this sort of genuine passion, if not for movies, certainly for something. But she has this genuine passion. So this becomes an, an unbelievable bestseller. It sells over 150,000 copies. Of course, this is, now we're moving into the early 60s where film was beginning to take off as a genuine art form. So, what, so it's interesting, to a large extent, part of her success is based on a certain level of failure where she becomes sort of like this uh, cultural icon. She gets a really big job from McCall's Magazine. Big deal. McCall's Magazine still exists. Big, big circulation because of her writings. She gets fired because she reviews The Sound of Music and thinks it's the worst motion picture that's been made in the last 25 years. <laughs> and she says, I mean, then in her rather volatile way of saying things, she sort of says things, you know, like she's not sure which are the Nazis. Are this the Nazis or is it the Van Traff family? I mean, as they, as, I mean who, who marches better? Do the Van Trapps march better or do the Germans march better? It's, it's, it was all very confusing. She didn't, and could anyone in that family do something else besides sing? Were they allowed? Is there, <laughs> so this pretty much, and this pretty much gets her, fi gets her fired, but it creates a reputation for her. Because there were a lot of, um, you have to also remember at the time, a very important factor that is not talked about in, in uh, Schwartz's book, maybe talked about in Kello's book, is that the, of the newspaper strikes in the early 1960s in New York City. And so all of a sudden, you would have that when there were a dozen papers, and then you had another Brooklyn papers, Queens papers, Staten Island papers, Bronx papers. Everybody had their own little movie reviewer. All of a sudden, you're down to none. And all you had was Village Voice or some other alternative piece. And this helped Andrew Saris and also whoever wrote for The New Yorker at the time, which was Bernard Gill, to become bigger voices. And Mr. Saris didn't think much of Sound of Music either. He just thought another Hollywood pablum, and who cares? But the key moment for Miss Kale is it centers around the movie Bonnie and Clyde. Now, the main film critic of the New York Times is, at this time was a gentleman named Brosley Crowther. Crowther? Crowther. Yes, Bosley, thank you. Bosley Crowther. And he had been the number one critic there for close to 25 years. <coughs> Very respectable. I mean, if you go to New York Times now and you punch in, you know, you know, pick a movie, any movie, made probably before 1960, and you punch in, the, he will be the reviewer. And he writes in a, you know, if you want to review that, it will be probably him. And he writes in a very clear, concise style. He gets to the point very quickly, and he has a nice sense of regular jargon in terms of it's just not highfalutin type of review, but you can understand, yes, it's rousing, good fun, et cetera, et cetera. But <clears throat> he tended to like movies that had social conscience. He tended to like movies that tried to uplift. He came from, you know, basically the, for lack of a better term, the lefties of the 30s, who sort of, they wanted art to be an educational tool. They saw art as rehabilitation, as a way to, for the masses to understand how they should act in a, co in a collective society. So when Mr. Crowther is confronted with, you know, this movie, Bonnie and Clyde, which is based on the story of two true people who, you know, 
who were more or less, I guess, in love with each other. And they just like robbing banks and shooting guns and killing people. I mean, they, they, they're certainly a moral, psychopathic state about this. And MacArthur found this awful, disgraceful, disgusting, etc. But at the same time, in fact, when uh, Warner Brothers, who produced this, this is actually one of the last movies Jack Warner, the famous Jack Warner, actually was involved in the production of before he left Warner, his, his studio. He didn't think anything of it at all. He thought it would be best for the drive-in circuits, you know, because there were a lot of the movies made by American International that were horror films or cheap movies or like the first movie Scorsese made, Boxcar Bertha, things like that, which basically exploitation movies. But all of a sudden there was this critical upsurge around her and she wrote on spec two extremely long articles and she sent to the New Yorker magazine. And the New Yorker magazine printed them. Now what she argued, it's really quite interesting argument, is that this story has been told before. And she gives specific examples. You only live once with Henry Fonda, and then it was made again, uh, they live by night, and it was made a third time called Gun Crazy. And they basically said, well, these characters were acceptable to someone like Brosley Crowther because society made them do it, or bad childhood made them do it, or et cetera made them do it, or this made it. So if you could, so if you could uh, somehow justify any sort of bad behavior, it was okay in a movie. And said, well, this movie doesn't justify anything. If anything, these people are having a hell of a good time until they get killed. <laughs> they were having a wonderful time. And there's also an interesting connection with this, because when I talk a little bit about her problems that she had with Andrew Sarris and people called Arturis, is that this, this is also connected to this, because originally the writers Robert Benton and David Newman wanted a French director to make this movie. They wanted his first Francois Truffaut to direct this, who then Truffaut didn't want to do it, so he suggested Jean-Luc Godard, who left in the middle of the thing because he wanted uh, Clyde, Clyde Barrow's character, to be homosexual and to have an affair with one of the other guys, and rather than impotent. So they had arguments, so he left, and that's, one, that's how uh, Arthur Penn ended up with it, and Warren Beatty taking an active role in, in the production of it. So this essentially, this thing, essentially does establish her as the person at the moment. So William Sean, who is the uh, editor-in-chief of New Yorker magazine, this very staid, very respectable, you know, pillar of, of, of New York culture, invites this crazy woman from California to come over there. Well, first of all, she didn't, she's never, she, even though I think of her as a New Yorker, always thought of her as a New Yorker, she hated New York. That's why she spent most of the time in Great Barrington when she became established and had more money. She had a home in Great Barrington until, until in fact, I believe she died there. I, can't, I don't recall. But, <clears throat> but she, she always liked to upset the boys. This is one of the things she always liked to do was upset the boys. So when, in the mid-1970s, uh, Deep Throat, who remembers Deep Throat? There you go. She wanted to review it. She wanted to do a serious academic review of Deep Throat. And she actually wrote, but she actually, there's a, a famous story where she brought an assistant with her and, and she said, and the assistant who came with her after the movie, she said, well, so that's a porn film. He says, yep. And she said, <laughs> she said something to the effect of, well, you lost your cherry. That's a you lost your porn film, Cherry. At least it was a good one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so these are the sort of things that it was like the boys versus the girls and, and things like that. So, so let's talk a little bit since that's, that's a basic background. Brought you up to roughly we're talking about nineteen yes, sixty-seven. Yeah. So we brought you up the late sixties. She's established her career. And then at this point, to make things even better, she decides to pick a fight with other film critics who were in New York City at the time. She decides to pick this fight. Now, now this is, this is why Bonnie and Clyde is a good place to start, because 
they're based in the early, late 1940s, right after World War II ended, in France, there was this whole period of time where the French didn't see any movies. So all of a sudden, there's American movies flood the marketplace. If you want to read an excellent article about it, it's in the New Yorker, March 2003, I think March 10th issue, by Louis Menans. Yes, Louis Menans is the same Menans as Menans. His great granduncle founded the village of Menans about almost 100 years ago. So he's related to where I work. <laughs> so. Uh, he's wrote this, where the connecting the French uh, appreciation of film to the American film um, rebirth that happened in the late 60s through the 70s and the 80s. So a bunch of they're watching all these movies, and all of a sudden, these, these young guys, Francois Truveau, Claude Chabrol, Eric Romer, uh, Jean-Luc Godard, Jacques Rivette, are watching all these movies, and they developed this, this theory through, their, and they had a father figure named uh, uh, Andre Bazin, who had a uh, journal that was called the Cahier du Cinema. So they had a basic theory that says, because one of the problems we have in movies is authorship. Who made this thing? You, I mean, you go to a movie, whether it's MGM, Warner Brothers, whether at the time it's Clark Gable or Humphrey Bogart, and there's people on the screen, they're all doing this stuff, and they're running around, but who, who, who's responsible for it? I mean, you take a book, you know, it says Pauline Kael on it. So what's in here is to a large extent she is responsible for. Or if you see any of these paintings on the wall, you have a pretty good idea who is responsible for that. Now, there may be extenuating circumstances in terms of who helped them, et cetera. But in film, it's this huge, monstrous thing. And especially when you uh, see about some of the classic films and how they were made, uh, like Gone with the Wind was complete, total chaos, the entire making of the movie. No one had any idea what they were doing. Uh, Casablanca the same way. Uh, they, they changed the ending, of the, they tried like seven different endings of Casablanca before they came upon, you know, this is a beautiful, this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. So there's this, all this chaos of people making, so you never know who's really in charge. So what the French saw that there were certain directors, no matter who wrote the screenplay, no matter what studio it was made at, no matter who the actors were, no matter who the cameraman was, et cetera, et cetera, there was a certain consistency. And these people, they, well, actually, Truffaut himself wrote an article called The Politique d'Arthur, in which these people are the artists. The director is the artist who's largely responsible for the work he's doing. And the larger personal imprint that he can put on this piece of work, the greater the artist he is. I mean, that's why when John Ford, Westerns, you know, you have certain things come to mind. And what it did is all of a sudden, these were these directors that in America we never heard of were becoming superstars. There is a famous, um, one of the guys who used to write for New York Times as a part-time reviewer was named Eugene Archer, who unfortunately passed away fairly early. He was a very good friend of Andrew Saris. And he went over to France in the late 50s, early 60s, just to see what was going on over there. And while he was there, he went to the Cinémathèque, which is the world's greatest place for movies, for studying the movies. And all of a sudden, they're talking about, they wanted him to tell them more about Howard Hawks. And Gene Archer had no idea who the hell was Howard Hawks. In fact, he rewrote Saracen's back in the exciting days of telegrams. He wrote a telegram to Andrew saying, Andrew, who the hell is Howard Hawks? And why should we care? So he wrote this thing. And this, and in fact, without the author theory, we would not know Howard Hawks. We would not know Bringing a Baby, Red River, uh, 20th Century, a uh, whole bunch of great motion pictures that <clears throat> because he was a Hollywood insider his entire career, he never, he was only a professional. He was never really, he was only nominated for an Oscar once. That was Sergeant York. 
he was never really went for the big prize. He was not a self-promoter like Alfred Hitchcock. He didn't make grand movies like John Ford or Cecil B. DeMille, but he had this wonderfully consistent pattern through all his films that basically were you know, the, what's called the professional code. And I'm too long to explain, but there, he had this long period of, of things to go through him. So, in 1962, uh, Mr. Saris puts all this work together and he writes an essay having, that uh, appears in film culture about the status of the American cinema at that time. And he notes, and he creates this pantheon, this level, there's a pantheon, includes John Ford, Orson Welles, et cetera, and then lower level letter. Now, this whole thing rubs <laughs> Pauline Kael the wrong way. And I think it has to, to do, she saw things as you, you experience, the movie goes on, you see it, you, you, you feel the experience, and then you write about the experience. You bring everything you've ever done, ever had, into that, and then you relate to it. And the whole idea of creating levels of this and that, the thing that she objected to most was that one of the examples Sarah's gave was that the best, the worst John Ford film is still better than the best Henry King film. Henry King was a one of the 20th Century Fox's uh, team of directors. He worked roughly at the same time at 20th Century Fox as Ford did. And, you know, uh, Daryl Zanuck liked trusting King with his big things because King probably wouldn't screw, he wouldn't add anything, but he wouldn't screw it up. So, so and she just told the whole idea that just because he made it, it's going to be better than this other guy, she really thought was offensive. And she wrote a response to a called Circles and Squares. Now, there's a funny story that's involved in this. So one day, Andrew Sarris gets his phone call. And on the other end of the phone was Pauline Kael. She loved to call people all the time. She loved to call and you know, people she had arguments with. She just loved picking the phone call. And uh, she came across, according to Sarah's, as this uh, bitchy, pushy woman who, who, was, who questioned his masculinity. And uh, they should go out and have some coffee. Now, in Sarah's mind, he's, he sees the, the beginning of The Woman of the Year, the, the Tracy Hepburn movie. How many have ever seen The Woman of the Year? Well, to recap quickly, tra <laughs> Uh, Catherine Hepburn pl uh, plays this um, character who sort of wants to save the world. She writes newspaper articles, et cetera. And Spencer Tracy plays a sports writer. And they have an argument about, is baseball important for society? And this is actually how Tracy and Hepburn met and had their lifelong affair from after that. So he, Im he imagines this is the same thing that's going to happen. He imagines he's going to meet Pauline Kale and they're going to be sparks are flying. And he met Miss Kell, and well, nothing happened. <laughs> it was it was a very much a disappointment on his part. But now there are two things I object to in in in, in, in this book, B mainly because of the narrowness of the author. I mean, excuse me, the editor, Mr. Swart, in that one of her most notorious works was called. Uh, raising Cain, which I can't imagine this today that um, the New Yorker would would publish a ten to fifteen thousand word essay about anything, but they did back in the seventies about the movie Citizen Kane, which is the time where she really came out against the auteurists, and she tried to say the real hero of, of Citizen Kane was the original screenwriter, Herman Mankiewicz, who wrote the script, basically based on the life of um, newspaper Arab, I can't think of his name. Where's, thank you, thank you, Mr. Hearst. And he had it up, he had it put away for a while, and he enjoyed it. And then finally Orson Welles is looking, he's brought on by RKO to make a movie. First he tries to do one of Heart of Darkness. Everyone wants to try to make a movie, Heart of Darkness. No one ever really succeeds. And so they settled on this. And Kale's thing was that, pardon? I thought he did succeed with the Well, that's debatable. Uh, Pauline Kale's, to bring up Pauline Kale's review is, 
why don't they just bomb the place in the first? <laughs> why send these guys up the river? They're going to bomb the place anyway. Just bomb the place to begin with. That was her response to Apocalypse Now. But uh, where was I? Yes, Heart of Darkness. So they decided on this original script. And you go through this basic process of everyone sits in a room and they yell and scream at each other. And, and eventually you, you create a movie out of all this yelling and screaming at each other. And she took it from the point of view that Mankiewicz was pushed aside. And it turns out a lot of this information was incorrect because she stole the idea from some guy at UCLA, a guy, a gentleman named Schwartz, who was working on his PhD. And he wasn't finished with it. And of course, she got caught because you can't run in these circles without being caught. So that was a bit of an embarrassment for her. But I think part of the, one of the problems that she had, as I mentioned before, is that because of her lack of formal education and the belief that you could go in sort of, sort of, you could create your own self. And you don't need to school, go to school to create your own self. She was always put off by academics, by academics who create systems and styles, and you conform to this, and you conform to that. Though it's interesting, <laughs> she will eventually become an auteurist. There were people that she adored, and they couldn't do any wrong. Steven Spielberg, uh, Robert Altman, Brian De Palma, Bernardo Bertolucci. These are her favorites. And they tended never to do anything wrong, so she <laughs> picked on that sort of stuff. But since we're running low on time here, I wanted to give you a flavor of her style of writing. And one of the things she, she a person she also admired as a director and felt really ambivalent about was Sam Peckinpah. Now, those of you who know Sam Peckinpah, who's really had a profound effect on movies today, not only in terms of violence, et cetera, but also in terms of fractured storytelling, in terms of most movie today, I don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, but it has a lot to do with, with, with Peckinpah's approach, because Peckinpah tried to show everything that went on at the same time at the same time. So if two characters are having a conversation right now, us, and there's also a scene where two, two other characters are having a conversation at that exact same moment, he was always trying to figure out a way to do them and show them at the same time. And, but unfortunately, that was his desire to do that, but unfortunately led people of lesser talent to not really follow up on that. Where is Killer really? Where is he here? Dr. Strangelove was good. Yes, notes on the nihilist Sam, the poetry of Sam Peckinpah. Sam Peckinpah is a great personal fil filmmaker. He's an artist who can work as an artist only on his own terms. When he does a, for, a job for hire, he must transform the script and make it his own, or it turns into a conventionless self party, like the parody, like the getaway. Peckinpah likes to say that he's a good whore who goes where he gets kicked. The truth is, he's a very bad whore. <laughs> he, can't, he cannot turn out routine craftsmanship. He can't use his skill to improve somebody else's conception. That's why he has always been in trouble. And a trouble plus the most difficult to decline of all gifts, a film sense, is the basis of his legend. So she has this. Of course, if you've ever read her last tango in Paris uh, homily, I don't know what else to call it. It's like the greatest thing that was ever made. But she wrote in this rather punchy style, and I, I actually have a series of her quotes here, here that can be kind of fun. As a man fumbles, oh, I don't want that. Where are my quotes? Oh. Now this is interesting. Who remembers Marshall McLuhan? You know, the medium is the message, blah, blah, blah. OK, McLuhanism and the media have broken the back of the book business. They freed people from, this, from the shame of not reading. <laughs> they rationalize be, becoming stupid and watching television. 
If you can't make a, a fun of a bad movie on serious subjects, what's the point? <laughs> a mistaken judgment isn't fatal, but too much anxiety about judgment is. Yes. <laughs> I've been told I've influenced some, some into becoming directors. Unfortunately, most of them are crap. <laughs> of course, there's uh, one story I want to leave you with before I were done, is that she was at a review once, a, a, a press screening of the movie, oh, Hotel New Hampshire, uh, based on a novel. And it was, it's notorious as one of the worst major motion pictures ever made. And in one of the... Uh, one of this, Rob Lowe's in it, and uh, I can't think of her name. Anyways, pardon? Yes, and other people, fairly famous, well-known people are in it. And so anyways, there's a scene there where a character says, and bears float, and from the back of the room comes this woman's voice. The one woman in the audience of all these men reviewers says, and so does it shit. <laughs> so, any questions? <laughs> Yes, sir. What was your life in Great Barrington like? Um, unfortunately, um, <laughs> I, I hate I hate to sort of like slough it off, but unfortunately, I didn't read the biography. Unfortunately, I was asked to read the the um, her, her the book of that was a collection. So I know enough about her her of her personal biography, so these make some sort of sense. But I don't know what her life was like. I'm sorry. You said you objected to two things about the book. What was the second? The first one was on... Oh, yes, yes. And it also, it, it deals largely with her reviews of movies and not about her views on other things, other critics. Like, her response to Saris and the auteur theory was called something called Circles and Squares. That's not in here. Um, so it's interesting, right from the, her first general article that she wrote about what she thought movies should be, right from the beginning in the early 1950s, was that unless there's an artist involved, it's not really, you can't really call it art because major motion pictures, large industrial motion pictures, for lack of a better term, aren't interested in art. They work on sociology, she would argue. They're interested in finding an audience that will fit this box. And instead of making the box, and if there's an audience, great. If there's not an audience, too bad. But on the other hand, it takes even to make TV shows now, a 30-minute situation comedy where this, you know, the whole action could take place in a one set like this. Say we just had a series of people come in and make some sort of HBO deal out of it. It still costs tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars per episode to do. It's at some point, <laughs> this gets expensive to have a hobby. Any questions? Yes, sir. I don't know whether you have paid attention to her uh, section on Indian movies. No. Yeah, I, I was reading the part oh, where okay. it talks about uh, Satyajit Ray movies. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. These. Yes. Uh, and uh, my question was that uh, I don't know the language in which he produced the movies. Mm -hmm. So I had difficulty in understanding most of it, except that culturally I can understand what's being presented. Yes. I don't know how the foreign writers may comment on that, uh, what they get out of it. That's what I'm trying to Well, understand. that's an interesting question, because there have been a lot of comments on there are certain foreign directors, foreign, completely foreign cultural directors, not just Western European but cultural directors like Gray, and also Akira Kurosawa in particular, in that their attitudes are towards things are more Western than they are Oriental. Like there are some people who think that someone like Osu in Japan is is a better understanding of what Japanese culture is about, as opposed to Akira Kurosawa, who makes made westerns <laughs> for like a seven samurai became the magnificent seven and it was just a real easy transition changing of the swords to guns a real easy transition and in mr ray's terms when um in the year early 50s jean renoir uh, the great film director made a, made a film called the river there 
and Ray was his assistant, Sajid Ray was his assistant, and that, I know Renoir had a profound personal effect on his, because everyone who's ever met John Renoir either falls in love with the man and becomes, because he's one of these great people who love all people and humanity and life. But I think there has to be, especially at the time, when most of his work was done in the late 50s through the 60s, there had to, since we as a culture didn't really have a hell of a lot of interest in learning about your culture, and quite honestly, that there had to be some sort of something we could hold on to to appreciate it. And I think there are certain things in Ray's work, especially uh, the certain sense of, uh, for lack of a better term, forgiveness, or a certain sense of unity, or a certain sense of, of being part of all of nature and everything being together, that we, especially those who are romanticists, could find uh, appealing, as opposed to today Bollywood movies, which which today now has increasingly not just. I mean, I have I'm, I'm I have one of the <laughs> for a little library. I have a terrific. He knows he's borrowed some of my Bollywood movies. I have a fairly large collection of Bollywood, but it's actually. Westerners are now, I'm just an uh, African-American woman who comes in and she just loves the singing and the dancing. That's yeah. what she says. She just loves it. Because so, they always break it out in the songs and, and the quality of them because you go, well, how good can they be? <laughs> Trust me, they're as good as anything that comes out of Hollywood. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. The technical qualities are top shelf. The directors are top shelf. Cinematography is top shelf. S scripts are you know, as good as what uh, uh, Stair and Rogers did. I mean, they're just wonderful stuff to watch. It's lots of fun. And you know, you just have to get past reading the subtitles. <laughs> yes. Any other? Yes. Uh, you know, I never thought of this before just now, but um, you you were talking about the background of Pauline Kale and and her or sort of serendipitous um, mm -hmm. uh, way of becoming a film critic. Mm -hmm. um, how are most film critics um, Educated to be film critics, are are they trained in graduate school, or did they just become a film critic because they start critiquing and? Well, that's an, well, that's an interesting question, especially now where uh, we're all film critics. I mean, because of Twitter right. and everything else, we're all film critics, and and um, so how does one get published? I guess this has not ever ever been published. Not that I really ever tried that hard, but uh, essentially I, I would imagine it's the same way. You just keep sending out articles and you, you hope for the best, and though it's more difficult now because everyone is a critic. But there's a certain pattern I've seen in criticism today where uh, I, you don't have the, I don't sense the same level of passion that used to be. Uh, I don't know, have you ever seen the movie Larry Crown Larry, with um, Tom Hanks and um, Julia Roberts? It's one of the two or three worst motion pictures I've ever seen. Worst? Yes, worst. Because it's not that it's, she's, she's charming, he's charming, he's wonderful, et cetera. But the movie's incompetently made. It's an incompetent mess. And you, you know, I mean, it's as simple as that. She teaches this class on speech, and he invites all these kids, all these, they become boyfriend, girlfriend. I mean, in the sense of boyfriend, girlfriend. They're not, you know, I can't imagine them as being adult lovers. I can only see them holding hands. It's just, it's just this uh, infantile movie. And even to the point where, you know, he says this, this class changed life. Well, it wasn't a class that changed his life. What the class that changed his life was the economics class he took that showed him how he could straighten out his life financially. But that's only if you've, you would understand the scene of the movie. And, there's, and it's very typical of, of how movies are made now in that we hope that scenes that, are, that test well, if you put enough of them together, you don't have to make a good movie. You don't have to make a movie that moves along. I mean, it has the charming hippie type girl on her little motor scooter. And it has, she, she's, she's married to a, uh, Julia Roberts' character is married is to an alcoholic failed author who then complains that her breasts are too small. This is Julia Roberts. <laughs> You're complaining about the smallness of Julia Roberts' breasts? So this stuff like this goes on, and it's just like, and there, so I looked at a bunch of reviews of it, and only one seemed to be really felt insulted by it. First of all, any of you read A.O. Smith in the New York Times? 
Can you, un Scott, sorry. Do you understand a word he says? No, no, honestly, no. No, I've read some of his reviews four times, and I don't know what he's talking about. Did you read the that review of the Descendants? No, I didn't, yeah. He's much better on older movies for some reason. Maybe because he thinks about it longer, or maybe somebody writes it for him. I don't know. But I, 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 I you know, and he wrote this four times that I was talking about. The only one who was really upset was, was Peter uh, Travers, who writes for The Rolling Stone, who just basically said, you can see, you almost see the blood coming out as he's watching this with this incompetent man. And also, sort of, there's an underlying thing that maybe the best thing that ever happened to him was complete financial disaster. It was the best thing that ever happened to this guy, was that his whole life just blew up. So, uh, 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 but anyways, that's neither here nor there. Since we're all critics now, yes. some of the critics now don't have the passion that do, do reviews matter anymore? Well, I know. That's a question. Has, have reviews ever been? I mean, it goes back to the whole cultural thing of uh, why do we have reviewers? I mean, let's face it. When you want to go out, see a movie, you're bored. You know, there's nothing on HBO which where the best movies are right now. Or there's, there's no movie now better than Boardwalk Empire. There's no movie out there better than... I can think about just about anything that's on HBO. And uh, so you, you read a review, and you sort of try to get a sense of what it's about. Actually, the first reviews were just basically descriptions of what the movie was about for movie showers. The, the, actually, I have a history of movie, but we'll get into some time. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I have one small question. I never understood what's the contribution of a producer in a movie. Uh, his main contribution is money. That is his main contribution. He, he's the one who decides how much money is going to be spent and how the money is going to be divvied up. And very often, the producer, because he's put up the money, decides what the movie is going to look like at the end, you know, and where you fire a director or fire something like that. The best example of a producer is, is if you ever read a biography of David O. Selznick, or Samuel Goldwyn, because these are active producers. Um, David Selznick, what, what, the thing is, he was making Gone with the Wind, and at the same time was making Rebecca, which is for uh, Alfred Hitchcock's first thing. He was making them at the same time. And he would write to the director, or to anybody, 10 to 15 page memos a day. So he could write like 300 memos a day telling him he looks better in a green hat, she looks better in blue, no, 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 we can't light it this way, he has to stand over here. And this is what he was. He was a person, because it was his money, and it was his particular vision, that even though he had hired a director to shoot the scene, if he didn't like the way the scene was shot, he wrote down specifically what was wrong with it, and if he didn't do it his way, there's someone else waiting step in, like God with the Wind went through, started out with one, then we had, then he, Sarah with George Kukor, who's fired, then there was Victor Fleming, who got the act together, and then he had a nervous breakdown, and then Sam Wood came in, and then, and then he heard that Sam Wood was doing a good job, so Victor Fleming all of a sudden got well, he came back, and then there was William Cameron Macy's, who was also directing, and sometimes all three of them were directing things at the same time. There was a, a love scene between, uh, between Scarlett and Ashley that was directed by Sam Wood. At the same time, Victor Fleming was directing a chasing. I and mean, so this is, how, this is why it's always difficult to find out who makes a movie, because there's this hodgepodge of stuff going on. But what a producer does is that he tries, he, he like herds the cats, for lack of a better term. He tries to pull it all together to make some sense so it doesn't cost too much money so maybe I can get some of my money back. But then that's the job of the editor too, the film editor? Well, the job of the film editor is he, he has this mountain of film and he tries to make a story out of it. Now, sometimes he'll make changes to, from the original vision. Sometimes a shot will work. He literally, it's like, um, most people don't know that Walden, uh, the famous book, Walden, was based on two years of experience on the pond by Thoreau. And what he did is that he wrote down his journal every day. And what he would do is that if he liked something that happened on October 14th, he would literally cut it out. 
as opposed to the other October 14th. And we take the part that he liked about October 14th and paste it into another book. <laughs> so that is pretty much what film editing is, is making a decision as to, I uh, have a selection of shots, how I can decide. The director gives me a certain amount of material in which we're having a conversation. He shoots from, from over my shoulder, shoots from over your shoulder, shoots a close-up like this of me, shoots up a close-up like you, shoots up a shot of her going, oh, God, won't they ever shut up? And, <laughs> and things like that. And the editor's job is to pull that all together. So that's what an editor basically does. Yes? Um, you know, there's a lot of independent film today. Yes. And so I was just wondering what the process is. I remember seeing uh, Frozen River yes. before it actually came out. And the, uh, I don't know what she was, who was the director or the producer. I, I don't know, but she was the, the person who was responsible mm -hmm. for it. She was talking about um, not knowing whether it would ever make it into the big uh, right. movie house, yep. et cetera. I was just curious now as ha to how uh, a film gets made. I mean, if you have an idea, um, you start filming it, and then who do you bring it to? Well, that, that's always been the, before the with the breakup of the Hollywood studios that happened in the, started in the 60s through today, that's always been a difficult situation. I mean, there are small distribution companies that take that, but it's still, it's still a big crapshoot. I mean, it's still like, you know, if you want to get a book published, you need an agent. Well, how do you get an agent? Get a book published. That's how you get an agent. So it's this self, you know, it's this circle. And, uh, Sometimes you get lucky. I, when I was at Columbia, I had friends who got lucky. Um, uh, Ron Neisweimer, who wrote uh, Philadelphia, he was able to associate himself through a work study program with Barbara Koppel, the documentary filmmaker. Uh, another student, a fellow student of mine, Catherine Bigelow, uh, she directed Hurt Locker. Um, <laughs> she went west and married James, James Cameron. And that was a very important part. Actually, she, I, I, I being, I'm being a bit catty with that, but um, she was a very focused, driven woman. Not, but, but she was also one of the nicest people I ever met at the same time. But yes, yes. There's a new book out, A Thousand Movies to See Before You Die. Yes. Have you read anything about this? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to say no. But, uh, uh, you know, you can sort of like a thousand movies before, you know, a thousand movies before I take Alka Seltzer. I, you know, I'm, uh, also personally, I, I, most movies made after about 1990, I can't sit through. They just give me a headache. And I find a lot of the independent people, like uh, John uh, Fauve, I think his name is, the guy who directed the Iron Man movies. He used to have a TV show on. Um, the independent film channel. We used, to, we used to sing around and smoke cigars and talk about how what idiots Hollywood people are. Well, now he's a Hollywood idiot. So, <laughs> so. That was a good show. It was, except, you know, he's a flaming hypocrite. But that's <laughs> neither here nor there. Do you have a question? I'm sorry. No, you... I was just observing the age of the audience here and yes. thinking about do, we, do these people actually go to movies? Because oh. I don't go to as many movies as I used to because I discount so much of what is Well, it's because they're not made for adults anymore. I mean, that's, a, that's a real problem. I'm uh, curious if yeah. everybody here would still be moving. I mean, I mean, you know, I, I see, uh, you know, like I see coming attractions for the, any of the Twilight movies and say, I'm sorry, I, my acne cleared up a long time ago. <laughs> I don't need to go see this movie. You know, you know young love. And what's fascinating, though, to me is uh, that all these movies about dealing with vampires and ghosts and dark and death, I, I don't know, is, is it because life for a lot of people in America today is not dangerous, that we have to have some sort of synthetic danger? That if you, know, if you love, before there always used to be this triangle of you know, love stories. You know, the parents don't like it, or the brother doesn't like the person you're dating. I mean, that's a standard. But now, you know, the other guy's a werewolf, and this guy's a vampire. <laughs> you know, you, you, know you, you get married, and God knows what's going to come out of you. You know, I, you know what sort of hit you? Uh, that never happened. That's not been my, part of my experience. 
Yes. What movie are you going to go to next? Oh, that's an excellent, <laughs> excellent question. What movie you saw last theater? Last movie in the theater? Yeah, yeah. What movie did I last see in the theater? That's been a long time. No, nah, I don't go to movies. Well, I mean, are you on Net Netflix or something? No, well, being the librarian, oh, okay. I can get movies all the time. <laughs> So what I'm doing is I'm building up my collection of, of French films. I've got these, there's this uh, French, uh, his name's Sasha Guitry, who supposedly makes, he makes the equivalent of Ernst Lubitsch movies in France. And finally, they're available in the US, so I've got that up. And I got some uh, Chantal Ackerman, Belgian filmmaker, feminist filmmaker. She's picked up one or two of her things. So since, you know, it's not my money, you know, I just... <laughs> It's not your buddy either, calm down. <laughs> it might be his, though, if you live in Benin. You really have a good collection of Bollywood movies. Thank you. I was pleading to Joe whether we can have some in Kalani. Yes. We don't have, have that. We have some, I mean. Yeah. Part of the work at the Benin's library. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't take the pay cut. How did you get into Bollywood movies? Well, because there are a lot of patrons who wanted to see them. I mean, uh, a significant regular users of the of yeah. dance library are. Uh, I mean, I, I, I did notice in the last five years there has been a large number of yes. Indian immigrants who live in Manans, yes. particularly in the apartment complex yes. area. Yes, indeed. So, I mean. Uh, my job is to serve the populace as a librarian. Yeah, it's, but you're directing them toward it too. Yes, I am. Yeah. It's well, it's you know, it's a two-way street. Exactly, give away. I'm still I can't come up with your question. I don't. What was oh. that? <laughs> the last movie you saw in the theater. Yeah. Did you I have a spectrum to see it? Oh, I hope it wasn't that long ago, because that's a long time ago. No, I, I, I. I, I well, what's HBO doing that you, you're so intrigued that it's been seen? Well, the part of it, well, the part, especially Boardwalk Empire in particular, one of the great um, criticisms of it, well, that's, that's understandable. That's, she's, the woman said it's very violent. It is. But the thing, one of the great criticisms, and using the word negative, what a criticism is, is that it moves slow. I don't find it slow. I, for me, the pace seems to be perfect because we live, you know, we have to now movies have to be frenetic. See, movies today have to be rides like on an amusement park. They have to give you, every moment has to be some sort of thrill. Um, and that seems to be the, the judgment of it. I mean, kids will come up to me, where are my horror films? Well, I don't have, I don't separate them out. Or where action adventures and and when a, if a movie moves at too slowly a pace, they're bored. And I like the fact that the pace, first of all, it's not, even though Scorsese produced this, it moves at a, by Scorsese standards, a glacial pace, because his movies tend to be very frenetic, very New York, et cetera. Yes? Well, I always look at the arts as a reflection of our time. Mm -hmm. And so I see movies, whether you know, they're yeah. not as good as they were, one yeah. ones were. But uh, uh, I also teach at the uh, university. And mm -hmm. uh, I teach public health. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of the semester, I uh, told my class that I thought that they should definitely see the movie Contagion. OK, yes. Yeah. So there was something, which yeah. is about a pandemic yes. flu. and. Um, and uh, the people who were consultants were from the Mailman School of Public Health in mm -hmm. Columbia and uh, the Department of Infectious Diseases. And uh, now there was one that was really, I think, uh, worth mm -hmm. viewing mm -hmm. um, cinematically um, and um, content-wise. And I think it, it really does reflect mm -hmm. the concerns of our society today. Mm -hmm. So there's one for you to look okay. at. OK. All right. <laughs> I'm ready. When it comes on DVD, I'll, I'll get it. Well,